Giuseppe Legato of Rai, Italian television, Gert Helwig of ZDF, German television, Charles Grunhausen of NOS, Dutch television, and Jean-Pierre de Menia of TF1, French television. If I could start immediately on your relations with the Soviet Union, do you feel that the failure to set a summit date is a maneuver by Mr. Gorbachev, or is it a serious diplomatic setback? I don't think it was a serious diplomatic setback, and uh, whether it was a maneuver or not, I wouldn't have an answer to that. I know that the, there was nothing negative in, to the extent of saying that they didn't want a summit. Uh, they just didn't. We were hoping they would uh, set a date, uh, which we have ex said to them that it's up to them to set the date that they would like to have it. And uh, I, I have not counted it out as yet, and I don't think that it was uh, a deliberate negative, uh, because I think then they would have simply said that <laughs> they weren't going to be here. Uh, sir, uh, do you agree with Secretary Schultz that said that uh, yesterday, he said that your patience is uh, running out with the Soviets? And let me ask you something else. Do you, uh, how do you comment this kind of uh, um, miscalculations about, uh, uh, I mean, everybody was so optimistic here in Washington DC about the summit. Everybody was saying uh, Gorbachev desperately needs a summit and uh, Gorbachev just said no. Well, are we talking about the, the intermediate range weapons, the so-called INF agreement? Because if we are, there were no real setbacks to that. It seems that uh, our negotiators have eliminated all, all the uh, major differences, and there may be a few little details to, to work out, but we, uh, we do believe that that's going to be signed. The second agreement, the one that has not really been fully discussed between us yet, which we call the START Agreement, is the strategic arms, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, and both sides had expressed a desire to uh, reduce them by 50 percent on both, on both sides. And uh, that was the thing that we were hoping would be talked about in a summit meeting. So of course we're a little up in the air now as to about when that's going to happen, but we still believe that uh, that we will get the uh, the intermediate range agreement. And uh, I hope so. I, I think our allies are all in favor of that. If you recall, that came into being when the Soviet Union set up the SS-20 missiles aimed at targets in Europe. And under my predecessor, before I was here, our allies in NATO asked for help in something to counter that. And it remained to us after I got here to send the Pershings and the, and the cruise missiles and so forth as a counter. And this was a, the standoff of ours was supposed to be a deterrent to their ever using theirs. Well, a deterrent is only good up to a point. If someone is foolish enough to <laughs> ignore it, then you have a destruction. So from six years ago, I suggested a zero, zero option on that particular weapon. They get their medium range weapons out, we get ours out. And at first, if you remember, they walked away from the table and refused to negotiate, but they came back to the table. And now uh, we are, I think, I think we're going to have success on that one. Mr. President, this situation reminds me a little bit um, of Reykjavik when success was so imminent and then it failed because of SDI. You probably won't tell us, but uh, I ask you anyway, is there any room left maneuvering on SDI on your part? Well, I, there may be some maneuvering on uh, deployment and so forth, but not to the extent of making that a bargaining chip in which we would give up SDI in return for something they might give up on their side. We can't do that. And I think that your audiences in your countries should understand better what SDI really is. Presently, there is no defense against nuclear weapons. And I don't think very many people are really aware of that. That what we have is the mutual assured destruction idea that we keep our missiles, they keep theirs, and then if either one 
fires their missiles, the other fires back, and the world blows up. Again, a deterrent. Well, we believe that there could be a madman one day who might uh, challenge that deterrent and declare war on the world. So what we are proposing is a sizable reduction, a 50% reduction in those weapons. But in the meantime, we have set out to see if there isn't a defense against the ballistic missile. And it looks like we are embarked on a path that is going to bring us into achieving such a, a, a defensive weapon. But I have always said that in my view, once that becomes a reality, then rather than have it appear that we want our missiles and the defense to protect us from others, that no, I would like to see us make the technology available to all in return for that all of us then give up our offensive weapons. The so-called MAD policy, Mutual Assured Destruction, this is a thing of uh, killing people. And the threat of killing people is to try and maintain the peace. If we could have a defensive system that would protect people against that, we're talking about protecting lives on both sides. And it's, I've described it somewhat as a little like after World War I, when in Geneva, all the countries of World War I decided against poison gas, but everybody kept their gas masks. Well, we need a gas mask for nuclear weapons, and we think that we're on the road, road to developing uh, such a thing. And therefore, it is not a bargaining chip. I say we're willing to be vo most reasonable about it. Our goal is to free the world, ultimately, from the threat of nuclear destruction. Until now, your position, for example, on INF has been very firm. Um, although the Russians walked away from the negotiations in Geneva, uh, they came back, you said. Are you expecting concessions from their side now? We have the problems, for example, on SDI. Do you, are you waiting for them to make concessions instead of making concessions yourself? Well, <laughs> no, we're willing to talk and discuss with them uh, as we have already. In fact, we did in, uh, in Reykjavik. And there, the uh, we had come to great agreement, both of us, on the desirability of doing away with nuclear weapons. But suddenly they threw that in the last moment that nothing could be done unless we agreed to destroy and stop trying to build such a defensive weapon. And uh, how could you guard against, see we all know how to make these missiles. How could you guard against someday someone secretly deciding, even after you'd done away with them, to build some of those and then blackmail the world. So we don't think it should be a bargaining chip, but also we think progress has been made in that they are just willing to discuss elements or deployment and so forth. Uh, and they have not come down as they did in Reykjavik with just a flat demand that that be eliminated. Mr. President, maybe we can talk about another subject. This morning there was a new dive at the New York Stock Exchange in New York, and you had a meeting with members of the Congress. Would you give up and accept to raise the taxes in your country? I cannot hold still for a tax that would reduce uh, the economy, or as I've said, would be deleterious to the economy. In this country, we have found that you can go, and I think in any country it's true, you can go beyond a certain point in taxes and you don't get more revenue. You get less because the tax burden reduces the economy. When we came into office, this administration, almost seven years ago, this country was in a recession. We had interest rates that were just beyond reason. We had inflation that was out of control. We had great unemployment. The major part of our economic reform was a reduction of tax rates. And 
now we are in the midst of the greatest, longest expansion of the economy that we've had in the history of our country. And, I, and it, we did not reduce the government revenues. The reduced rates plus the increase in the economy are bringing us in more revenue, not less. And therefore, I don't believe that it, anyone should propose uh, to go back to that policy of a tax increase that would suddenly uh, reduce our growth. We have almost doubled our gross national product since we took office. Now, our taxes bring in about 19, or amount to about 19 percent of the gross national product. Now, when the gross national product was $2 trillion, and you were still getting 19 percent in tax rates, but when the gross national product went to four million, and you were still getting 19 percent of that increased amount, it shows that tax, <laughs> taxes can be a threat to the economy. But Mr. President, might you be open to persuasion, either by some very persuasive congressman or by a further slide in the stock market, to change your mind and put in some limited more taxes? Well, since we this morning have arrived at the uh, the decision and the agreement that we're all going, we're going to put together their team and ours now to negotiate on the matter of our deficit, reduce the deficit. No, I'm sure that there, as a matter of fact, uh, I had suggested in my budget that I sent up and which they refused to consider some adjustments to some of our taxes, but not the just flat going out and raising, say, the income tax. Uh, we once had a top bracket in our income tax. Uh, when I was a civilian out there making motion pictures, that was 90 percent the tax rate. Well, I saw it firsthand, my own experience, what that can do. After I reached the 90 percent bracket, I just vacationed. They could send me a script and I wasn't going to do another picture for 10 cents on the dollar. Well, now we have come down in our tax reform to where the top rate is only going to be 28 percent. But as I've said, we have seen the same people uh, in the upper brackets who are bearing the greatest part of the tax burden. They are paying today a greater share of the total tax revenues since we reduced the rates because there's an incentive now to make more money. Uh, sir, uh, do you still consider realistic to cooperate with the Soviet Union on the Persian Gulf? particularly on convincing the Iranians to accept the ceasefire. I mean, it's what happened in Moscow. It's uh, uh, the fact that the Soviet Union says uh, that all the um, uh, forces uh, from the uh, Persian Gulf has to be withdrawn. And uh, uh, they disagree on sanctions against Iran. Well, the main thing is to end the war. And the, and the Soviet Union, and the Chinese were both with us solidly in the Security Council voting of Resolution 598, which was the one that both countries should agree to a ceasefire. Stop a war with no victor, no defeated. Just agree to separate and return to their own borders at peace. The second part that, of that, which had to be voted on again and has not been yet, was that if one side or the other refused 598, then the world agreed to embargo or boycott them for any sale of munitions or weapons. Now, Iraq agreed to 598. Iran did not. Now, before the UN, is the consideration of whether we will go for the second, the boycotting of arms sales to, uh, to Iran. They're going a little slow because, and that's because the General Secretary, uh, I get mixed up, the Secretary General. General Secretary is Gorbachev. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary General of the United Nations is um, uh, still working on Iran and trying to persuade them to agree before we take are required to take this second action. There has been no indication on the part of the Soviets that they would turn 
and uh, not support the second resolution as they did the first. Please forgive me, Mr. President, if I return to the money market and the economics again, because I think there's an important question. There have been confusing signals by your Secretary Baker concerning the exchange rates. Um, would you consider the value of the, the dollar okay where it is right now? Well, I think, I think Secretary Baker has been misunderstood. He feels, as I do, that the Louvre agreement that we've all agreed to there, that that agreement about maintaining a stability in the currency exchange is effective and that we're, we pledge ourselves to go by that. And uh, I don't know where this uh, misunderstanding came that he was suggesting something else. But uh, we are we're convinced and we're satisfied to observe the Louvre Agreement to maintain the stability of the currencies. I wonder sometimes if what happened in the market is not a case of maybe the market overpriced itself and is now making a corrective change. Mr. President, a few weeks ago when Mr. Schaefer Nasser was here, the summit was announced, the INF agreement was announced, Howard Baker said the lame duck status of the president is postponed for a long, long time. What's the situation after last week? The problems on Wall Street? No summit, not yet a complete INF agreement. Are you a lame duck again or still? I don't think so. It's a term we use here, of course, when anyone in high office is uh, uh, prevented by law, as I am, from seeking another term so that the people in the legislature don't have to wonder whether you're going to be in a campaign or uh, in an election again. Uh, they, we use that term. But no, I think the very fact that uh, today I met with the congressional leadership of both parties, we are, we did make progress, we are going forward with uh, uh, two negotiating teams to come together on how we can deal with the, uh, the budget deficit, which we do think is the, the biggest uh, threat to anything. It's, and it's been going on for many, many years and far too long. And I set out to try and eliminate the deficit when I first came here. But unfortunately, uh, the Congress has the last word about spending money, and they have been more willing to spend <laughs> than I would have been. So each budget that I've sent up, they've ignored. Uh, because I, they said I had too many spending cuts in it. But I think that we are going to work together, and we will come to a settlement, and that's going to take a little give and take on both sides. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you a personal question. Last week, everything was going wrong. You are a human being as well as President of the United States. Did not ever think I would be better riding in my ranch? Wouldn't I would be better riding in my ranch instead of being here in the White House with all these problems? Well, on the other hand, uh, I have to say that there's a Something to be, well, someone, a very wise man once said, life begins when you begin to serve. And I think he was right. If I can do some good for this country that I love so much, for the people, uh, and even for the world with regard to peace and so forth, all right, I'm willing to do that. And uh, I don't ride as much as I used to, but I get a few opportunities and, uh, when the Congress takes its leave and I can get back to the ranch uh, a and little next bit. Thanksgiving. And, what? And next like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yes. In August, they take a very lengthy recess of about three weeks. I was riding every day, and cutting wood in the afternoon. Or do you wonder sometimes, sir, that your legendary luck is running out? I never called it luck. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, we have an unusual situation that parliamentary forms of government don't have. And that is here that you can have, as I have now, a Congress in which both houses of the legislature have a majority of the opposition party. Well, they're not too enthusiastic about doing everything that I want done. And uh, for the six years up until this present year, I at least had one house, the Senate. And I think that then they in the legislature, because both Senate 
houses have to agree on measures. Well, there, some compromising was done when they formed an agreement on a piece of legislation. And uh, many times it was something that I could then sign. Uh, but as I say, that's an unusual thing in our, our government here that we should have this. We've had it for quite some time in our Congress, uh, that kind of a, a division between the executive branch and the legislature. Uh, I don't mean that I'm opting for a parliamentary system. I think our system's worked reasonably well for a couple of hundred years and uh, we'll stay with it. But it's been more difficult since the 84 election when the balance changed and they had both a majority in both houses. Still, uh, this morning, I think we were all agreed that we want to seek uh, an answer uh, to this problem. Mr. President, they're signaling to me that our time is up, and thank you oh. for sharing it with us. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Very much.